Oh, hi. Hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am that host of yours, the one who brings up the dreaded feminist boogeyman, the patriarchy. I'm Liv, and I am here not with more feminist nonsense, she said in a very sarcastic tone, but instead a simple reading of Ovid's Metamorphoses. That's right, today is another day for me reading something to you in between conversation episodes so that I have a moment to get my head on straight, not to mention record and edit loads more of them, because that is what I do basically all of the time, and so here we are. Today we're diving into book three of the Metamorphoses, which means we're about to hear about my favorite characters of all time, Cadmus and Harmonia, among other people, but obviously I'm, I'm highlighting Cadmus and Harmonia. And, well, their marriage leads to absolutely endless myths of all your favorite characters, so just know this one is going to be thrilling. Now, as always, these are very old translations in order for me to be able to read them without copyright issues, but I do my best to translate supremely dated phrasing in the moment to make it a little bit easier to understand. You know, words like thou and thy and twain. Who uses a word like twain? Like, get out of here. Still, it's Ovid and we love to hear some metamorphoses, so we must accept these stuffy old translations. Except, except maybe for one special reading in the future? But we will have to wait just a tiny bit longer for news on that one. Stay tuned. And related, if you want more Ovid, you should definitely pre-order a new translation that's coming out next week. Ovid's Metamorphoses, translated by Stephanie McCarter. It's a first translation by a woman in over 60 years, and it's going to be good. And I'll have Stephanie on the show to tell you so much more about that process. But for now, the old-timey one. Uh, just a reminder, we last left off just as Jupiter, Zeus, had kidnapped Europa from Phoenicia and had her on his back in the form of that bull. This is Ovid's Metamorphoses, translated by Brooks Moore, Book 3, Part 1. Now Jupiter had not revealed himself, nor laid aside the semblance of a bull, until they stood upon the plains of Crete. But not aware of this, her father bade her brother Cadmus search through all the world, until he found his sister, and proclaimed him doomed to exile if he found her not. Thus was he good and wicked in one deed. When he had vainly wandered over the earth, for who can fathom the deceits of Jove, Cadmus, the son of Agenor, shunned his country and his father's mighty wrath. But he consulted the famed oracles of Phoebus, and inquired of them what land might offer him a refuge and a home. And Phoebus answered him, when on the plains a heifer, that has never known the yoke, shall cross your path, go that way with her, and follow where she leads, and when she lies to rest herself upon the meadow green, there shall you stop, and it will be a sign for you to build upon that plain the walls of a great city, and its name shall be the city of Boeotia. Cadmus turned, but hardly had descended from the cave, Castalian, ere he saw a heifer go unguarded, gentle paced without the scars of labor on her neck. He followed close upon her steps, and silently adored celestial Phoebus, author of his way, till over the channel that Cephasus wears he forded to the fields of Panope, and even over to Boeotia. There stood the slow-paced heifer, and she raised her forehead, broad with shapely horns, towards heaven, and as she filled the air with lowing, stretched her side upon the tender grass, and turned her gaze on him who followed in her path. Cadmus gave thanks, and kissed the foreign soil, and offered salutation to the fields and unexplored hills. Then he prepared to make large sacrifice to Jupiter, and ordered slaves to seek the living springs whose waters in libation might be poured. 
there was an ancient grove whose branching trees had never known the desecrating axe, where hidden in the undergrowth a cave, with osiers bending round its low-formed arch and hollowed in the jutting rocks, deep found in the dark centered of that hollowed grove, beneath its arched roof a beauteous stream of water welled serene. Its gloom concealed a dragon, sacred to the warlike Mars, crested and gorgeous with iridescent scales, and eyes that sparkled as the glow of coals. A deadly venom had puffed up its bulk, and from his jaws he darted forth three tongues, and in a triple row his sharp teeth stood. Now those who ventured of the Tyrian race, misfortuned followers of Cadmus, took the path that led them to this grove, and when they cast down splashing in the springs, an urn, the hidden dragon stretched his azure head out from the cavern's gloom and vented forth terrific hissings. Horrified, they dropped their urns. A sudden trembling shook their knees, and their lifeblood was ice within their veins. The dragon wreathed his scales in rolling knots, and with a spring, entwisted in great folds, reared up his bulk beyond the middle rings, high in the air from whence was given his gaze the extreme confines of the grove below. A size prodigious, his enormous bulk, if seen extended where was not to hide, would rival in its length the serpent's folds. Involved between the plains of the twin bears, the terrified Phoenicians, whether armed for conflict or in flight precipitate, or whether held incapable from fear, he seized with sudden rage, stung them to death, or crushed them in the grasp of crushing folds, or blasted with the poison of his breath. High in the heavens the sun small shadow made, when Cadmus, wondering what detained his men, prepared to follow them. Clothed in a skin torn from a lion, he was armed complete with lance of glittering steel and with a dart, but passing these he had a dauntless soul. When he explored the grove and there beheld the lifeless bodies, and above them stretched the vast victorious dragon licking up the blood that issued from their ghastly wounds, his red tongues dripping gore. Then Cadmus, filled with rage and grief, Behold, my faithful ones, I will avenge your deaths, or I will share it. He spoke, and lifted up a millstone huge in his right hand, and having poised it, hurled with a tremendous effort, dealing such a blow would crush the strongest builded walls. Yet neither did the dragon flinch the shock, nor was he wounded, for his armor scales fixed in his hard and swarthy hide repelled the dreadful impact. Not the javelin thus so surely by his armored skin was foiled, for through the middle segment of his spine the steel point pierced and sank beneath the flesh, deep in his entrails. Writhing in great pain, he turned his head upon his bleeding back, twisting the shaft with force prodigious, shook it back and forth, and wrenched it from the wound, with difficulty wrenched it. But the steel remained securely fastened in his bones. Such agony, but made increase of rage. His throat was swollen with great knotted veins, a white froth gathered on his poisonous jaws, the earth resounded with his rasping scales. He breathed upon the grass a pestilence, steaming mephitic from his Stygian mouth. His body writhes up in tremendous gyres, his folds now straighter than a beam, untwist. He rushes forward on his vengeful foe, his great breast crushing the deep-rooted trees. Small space gave Cadmus to the dragon's rage, for by the lion's spoil he stood the shock, and thrusting in his adversary's jaws the trusted lance gave check his mad career. Wild in his rage, the dragon bit the steel and fixed his teeth on the keen, biting point. Out from his poisoned palate, streams of gore spouted and stained the green with sanguine spray.
yet slight the wound, for he recoiled in time and drew his wounded body from the spear. By shrinking from the sharp steel, saved his throat a mortal wound. But Cadmus, as he pressed the spear point deeper in the serpent's throat, pursued him till an oak tree barred the way. To this he fixed the dragon through the neck, the stout trunk bending with the monster's weight, groaned at the lashing of his serpent tail. While the brave victor gazed upon the bulk enormous of his vanquished foe, a voice was heard, from whence was difficult to know but surely heard. Son of Agonor, why are you standing by this carcass? For others shall behold your body changed into a serpent. Terrified, amazed, he lost his color and his self-control. His hair stood upright from the dreadful fright. But lo, the hero's watchful deity, Minerva, from the upper realms of air appeared before him. She commanded him to sow the dragon's teeth in mellowed soil, from which might spring another race of men. And he obeyed, and as he plowed the land, took care to scatter in the furrowed soil the dragon's teeth, a seed to raise up man. It's marvelous, but true. When this was done, the clods began to move. A spear point first appeared above the furrows, followed next by helmet-covered heads, nodding their cones, their shoulders, breasts, and arms weighted with spears, and largely grew the shielded crop of men. So it is in the joyful theaters when the gay curtains, rolling from the floor, are upward drawn until the scene is shown. It seems as if the figures rise to view. First we behold their faces, then we see their bodies and their forms by slow degrees appear before us on the painted cloth. Cadmus, affrighted by this host, prepared to arm for his defense. But one of those from earth created cried, Arm not away from civil wars. And with his trenchant sword he smote an earth-born brother, Hand to hand, even as the vanquished, so the victor fell, pierced by a dart some distant brother hurled. Likewise he who cast that dart was slain, both breathing forth their lives upon the air, so briefly theirs expired together. All as if demented leaped in sudden rage, each on the other dealing mutual wounds. So, having lived the space allotted them, the youthful warriors perished as they smote the earth, their blood-stained mother, with their breasts, and only five of all the troop remained, of whom Echion, by Minerva warned, called on his brothers to give up the fight, and cast his arms away in pledge of faith. When Cadmus, exiled from Sidonia's gates, builded the new city by Apollo named, these five were trusted comrades in his toil. Now Thebes is founded. Who can deem thy days unhappy in shine exile, Cadmus? You, the son-in-law of Mars and Venus? You, whose glorious wife has borne to shine embrace daughters and sons? And your grandchildren join around thee, almost grown to man's estate? Nor should we say he leads a happy life, till after death the funeral rites are paid. Your grandson, Cadmus, was the first to cast your dear felicity in sorrow's gloom. Oh, it was pitiful to witness him, his horns outbranching from his forehead, chased by dogs that panted for their master's blood. If you should well inquire, it will be shown his sorrow was the crime of fortune, not his guilt, for who maintains mistakes are crimes? Upon a mountain stained with slaughtered game, the young Hyantian stood. Already day, increasing to meridian, made decrease the flitting shadows, and the hot sun shone between extremes in equal distance. 
such the hour when speaking to his fellow friends the while they wandered by those lonely haunts Actaeon of Hyantis kindly thus our nets and steel are stained with slaughtered game the day has filled its complement of sport now when aurora is in her saffron car bringing back the light of day we may again repair to haunts of sport now phoebus hangs in middle sky cleaving the fields with heat enough of toil take down the knotted nets all did as he commanded and they sought their needed rest there is a valley called Gargaphia, sacred to Diana, dense with pine trees and the pointed cypress, where, deep in the woods that fringed the valley's edge, was hollowed in frail sandstone and the soft white pumice of the hills an arch, so true it seemed the art of man, for nature's touch ingenious it had so fairly wrought the stone, making the entrance of a grotto cool. Upon the right a limpid fountain ran, and babbled as its lucid channel spread into a clear pool edged with tender grass. Here, when a wearied with exciting sport, the sylvan goddess loved to come and bathe her virgin beauty in the crystal pool. After Diana entered with her nymphs, she gave her javelin, quiver, and her bow to one accustomed to the care of arms. She gave her mantle to another nymph who stood nearby her as she took it off. Two others loosed the sandals from her feet, but Crocali, the daughter of Ismenus, more skillful than her sisters, gathered up the goddess's scattered tresses in a knot. Her own were loosely wantoned on the breeze." Then in their ample urns dipped the water and poured it forth, the cloud nymph Nephili, the nymph of the crystal pools called Hyali, the raindrop Ranus, Piscas of the dews, and Phyali, the guardian of their urns. And while they bathed Diana in their streams, Actaeon, wandering through the unknown woods, entered the precincts of that sacred grove, with steps uncertain wandered as his fate directed for his sport must wait till morn. Soon as he entered where the clear springs welled or trickled from the grotto's walls, the nymphs, now ready for the bath, beheld the man, smote on their breasts, and made the woods resound, suddenly shrieking. Quickly gathered they to shield Diana with their naked forms, but she stood head and shoulders taller than her guards, as cloud bright tinted by the slanting sun or purple dyed aurora, so appeared Diana's countenance when she was seen. Oh, how she wished her arrows were at hand, but only having water, this she took and dashed it on his manly countenance, and sprinkled with the avenging stream his hair, and said these words, presage of future woe. Go tell it, if your tongue can tell the tale. Your bold eyes saw me stripped of all my robes. No more she threatened, but she fixed the horns of a great stag firm on his sprinkled brows. She lengthened out his neck, she made his ears sharp at the top, she changed his hands and feet, made long legs of his arms, and covered them with dappled hair. His courage turned to fear. The brave son of Autonoe took to flight, and marveled that he sped so swiftly on. He saw his horns reflected in a stream, and would have said, Ah, wretched me! But now he had no voice, and he could only groan. Large tears ran trickling down his face, transformed in every feature. Yet as clear remained his understanding, and he wondered what he should attempt to do, should he return to his ancestral palace, or plunge deep in vast vacuities of forest wilds? Fear made him hesitate to trust the woods, and shame deterred him from his homeward way. While doubting thus his dogs espied him there, first Blackfoot and the sharp-nosed Tracer raised the signal. Tracer of the Gnosian breed and Blackfoot of the Spartan, swift as wind, the others followed. Glutton, Quicksight, Surefoot, three dogs of Arcadia, then Valiant, Killbuck, Tempest, Fierce, Hunter, and the Rapid Wingfoot, 
sharp-scented chaser and wood ranger wounded so lately by a wild boar, savage wildwood the wolf begot with the shepherdess the cow dog, and ravenous harpy followed by her twin whelps and the thin girt laid on chosen from Siconia. Racer and barker, brindled spot and tiger, sturdy old stout and white-haired blanche and black smut, lusty big lacon, trusty storm and quickfoot, active young wolfet, and her Cyprian brother, black-headed snap, blazed with a patch of white hair from forehead to his muzzle, swarthy black coat and shaggy bristle, Towser and Wildtooth, his sire of Dictian, his dam of Lacon, and yelping babbler. These and others, more than patience leads us to recount or name, all eager for their prey the pack surmount rocks, cliffs, and crags precipitous, where paths are steep, where roads are none. He flies by route so oft pursued, but now, alas, his flight is from his own. He would have cried, Behold your master, it is I, Actaeon. Words refused his will. The yelping pack pressed on. First, Blackmane seized and tore his master's back. Savage the next, then Rover's teeth were clinched deep in his shoulder. These, though tardy out, cut through a bypath, and arriving first clung to their master till the pack came up. The whole pack fastened on their master's flesh till place was none for others. Groaning, he made frightful sounds that not the human voice could utter, nor the stag, and filled the hills with dismal moans. And as a suppliant fell down to the ground upon his trembling knees and turned his stricken eyes on his own dogs, entreating them to spare him from their fangs. But his companions, witless of his plight, urged on the swift pack with their hunting cries. They sought Actaeon, and they vainly called Actaeon, Hi, Actaeon, just as though he was away from them. Each time they called, he turned his head, and, and when they chided him, whose indolence denied the joys of sport, how much he wished an indolent desire had haply held him from his ravenous pack— Oh, how much better it is to see the hunt and the fierce dogs than feel their savage deeds. They gathered round him and they fixed their snouts deep in his flesh, tore him to pieces. He whose features only as a stag appeared. Tis said Diana's fury raged with none abatement till the torn flesh ceased to live. Hapless Actaeon's end in various ways was now regarded. Some deplored his doom, but others praised Diana's chastity, and all gave many reasons. But the spouse of Jove, alone remaining silent, gave no praise nor blame. Whenever calamity befell the race of Cadmus, she rejoiced in secret, for she visited her rage on all Europa's kindred. Now a fresh occasion had been added to her grief, and wild with jealousy of Semele, her tongue as ever ready to her rage, lets loose a torrent of abuse. Away, away with words, why should I speak of it? Let me attack her, let me spoil that jade. Am I not Juno, the supreme of heaven, queen of the flashing scepter? Am I not sister and wife of Jove omnipotent? She even wishes to be known by him a mother of a deity, a joy almost denied to me. Great confidence has she in her great beauty. Nevertheless, I shall so weave the web the bolt of Jove would fail to save her. Let the gods deny that I am Saturn's daughter, if her shade descend not stricken to the Stygian wave. She rose up quickly from her shining throne, and hidden in a cloud of fiery hue, descended to the home of Semele, and while encompassed by the cloud, transformed her whole appearance as to counterfeit old Beroe, an Epidaurian nurse who tended Semele. Her tresses changed to grey, her smooth skin wrinkled, and her step grown feeble as her she moved with trembling limbs. Her voice was quivering as an ancient dame's, as Juno, thus disguised, began to talk to Semele. When presently the name of Jove was mentioned, 
artful Juno thus, doubtful that Jupiter could be her love. When Jove appears to pledge his love to you, implore him to assume his majesty in all his glory, even as he does in presence of his stately Juno. Yes, implore him to caress you as a god. With artful words as these, the goddess worked upon the trusting mind of Semele, daughter of Cadmus, till she begged of Jove a boon that only hastened her sad death. For Jove, not knowing her design, replied, Whatever you wish, it shall not be denied, and that your heart shall suffer no distrust, I pledge me by that deity, the waves of the deep Stygian lake, oath of the gods, all overjoyed at her misfortune, proud that she prevailed, and pleased that she secured of him a promise that could only cause her own disaster. Semele addressed Almighty Jove, Come unto me in the splendor of your glory, as your might is shown to Juno, goddess of the skies. Fain would he stifle her disastrous tongue, before he knew her quest the words were said, and knowing that his greatest oath was pledged, he sadly mounted to the lofty skies, and by his potent nod assembled there the deep clouds, and the rain began to pour, and thunderbolts resounded. But he strove to mitigate his power, and armed him not with the flames overwhelming, as had put to flight his hundred-handed foe Typhaeus, flames too dreadful. Other thunderbolts he took, forged by the cyclops of a milder heat, with which insignia of his majesty, sad and reluctant, he appeared to her. Her mortal form could not endure the shock, and she was burned to ashes in his sight. An unformed babe was rescued from her side, and nurtured in the thigh of Jupiter, completed nature's time until his birth. I know his aunt, in secret nursed the boy and cradled him, and him Nicaean nymphs concealed in caves and fed with needful milk. While these events, according to the laws of destiny, occurred, and while the child, the twice-born Bacchus, in his cradle lay, tis told that Jupiter, a careless hour, indulged too freely in the nectar cup, and having laid aside all weighty cares, jested with Juno as she idled by. Freely the god began, who doubts the truth? The female's pleasure is a great delight, much greater than the pleasure of a man. Juno denied it, wherefore t'was agreed to ask Tiresias to declare the truth, that whom none knew both male and female joys, for wandering in a green wood he had seen two serpents coupling, and he took his staff and sharply struck them, till they broke and fled. Tis marvellous, that instant he became a woman from a man, and so remained while seven autumns passed. When eight were told, again he saw them in their former plight, and thus he spoke. Since such a power was wrought, by one stroke of a staff my sex was changed. Again I strike. And even as he struck the same two snakes, his former sex returned, his manhood was restored. As both agreed to choose him umpire of their sportive strife, he gave decision in support of Jove. From this the disappointment Juno felt surpassed all reason, and enraged, decreed eternal night should seal Tiresias' eyes. Immortal deities may never turn decrees and deeds of other gods to naught, but Jove, to recompense his loss of sight, endowed with him the gift of prophecy. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. How fun was that? What did I say about Cadmus and Harmonia's children, even if this translation didn't once name Harmonia? Whew. Anyway, they've got some famous shit going on, and I love them for it. Action and Semele, and oh, uh, there's just so much more to come. On the next reading episode, we're going to get a, to a real favorite of so many of you, Echo and Narcissus, and oh my god, so much Bacchus. Oh, so much Bacchus. But for now, thanks as always. You're the best.
I do love these transformation stories and Ovid's take on them, but I, I really can't wait for y'all to hear more about Stephanie McCarter's translation. Uh, it's so fresh and readable and generally just great because she went into it with a feminist mindset, wanting to avoid so many of the pitfalls of p past translations. Bizarre inclusions of misogyny. You know the ones. We deal with them all the time. Hence the excitement. So stay tuned for more on that or pre-order the book so that you have your very own copy of such a brilliantly enjoyable new translation. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and video, to editing and research. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek myth and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. I am Liv, and I, I really do love Ovid. Like, what an interesting guy. Whew.